Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I had the opportunity to help with the first Hadoop World in 2009, and there were not many of us in a small conference, set of conference rooms at the Roosevelt Hotel in Midtown, and now I'm told we passed 5,000 people today. So clearly, we started a revolution. Powerful concepts delivered in a collection of open source projects has changed how we can use data. We've got high fidelity information from many sources. Every year we get new capabilities that allow us to do more interesting things with it. And the net result is that data is more accessible than it ever has been before. This gives us a more complete picture of our world. And from that picture, we can start to get insights that will power economic and social growth. So the big question now and, and for the next five years is how will we choose to use the data hubs that we can now build? And the privacy and ethical handling of our data is important for its own right, but it's also precisely what we need to solve so that we can use data for good. And there are a lot of uh, opportunities to do that. There, in particular, healthcare is starting to take advantage of big data. The Michael J. Fox Foundation has been working with Intel to understand the progression of Parkinson's. And one of the things that's been historically challenging about Parkinson's is that the symptoms are highly variable, but we have patients only see doctors infrequently, and then they only see them for a small period of time. So we don't have a very good picture of, of what they are. But now using wearables, we can look at the measurable symptoms of the disorder, like tremors or sleep quality, slowness of movement, and get a much better understanding of the disease. This will let us evaluate treatments uh, and ultimately, hopefully, find a cure. And today, this is a research project, but what if it was available to every Parkinson's sufferer? We're deploying sensors everywhere from our ocean to our buildings to our roads to the atmosphere to outer space. And the data we're collecting is already giving us a good picture about our environment and climate change. This is precisely what we need to know to figure out how we're going to adapt to it. And big data is playing a role in the energy revolution writ large. You know, if we can collect information for the entire energy life cycle from the time we produce it through the time we consume it, we can do amazing things on how we more efficiently use energy. And there's great examples of that today. Opower looks at billions of meter readings every minute and then uses that to improve the grid and help us use energy more efficiently. What if we could combine the environmental data with all of the supply chain data and understand for all of the products that we choose from what the environmental impact, what energy was used, and how it was created, and so that we knew as consumers what we were doing? Our education system is struggling with data. We've got school data stored in a lot of different places, and we've got more school data than we ever had before. Everything from you know, grades and attendance and obvious stuff like that down to what kids are eating for lunch. Uh, it's stored in a lot of places, and there's no uniform way to store or access it. What if we had a data hub with high fidelity school information for the entire country? We could figure out how to better match learning styles to teaching styles to pair up the right students with the right teachers. We could use predictive analytics to try to help students before they fail. And what if we had that data for the entire world? We typically talk about education as if it were a zero-sum game where countries compete with one another, right? But what if we used the data from all the schools and shared it to help education generally? And despite all the progress, and there has been great progress in a number of these areas, there's still a pretty big gap between our ambitions of how we can use data for good and the reality that we have today. Uh, the progress and the potential of this technology means we as a community get a lot of scrutiny. So there are a lot of talks about brainstorming about the possibilities uh, and some other talks about kind of hand-wringing about the risks. And, and that makes sense, right? The technology has raised the stakes. Analytics used to be about looking at corporate transactions, and now we're talking about understanding all of our personal interactions. And open data is powerful, but we can't limit progress to just the data sets that we can share freely. So we have to figure out the privacy and ethical issues around data so that we can use data for good. 
And there's a telling example uh, recently in the education uh, sphere that shows why we need to do this. There was a, a nonprofit called InBloom, and they had built a service for managing student data. And the goal there was to give, uh, create a resource for teachers so they could get a more complete picture of student progress and then use that to individualize instruction. And despite being very well funded, they had hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, they failed. Schools pulled out, and that's mostly due to the fact that people were concerned about how the data, data would be handled, whether it would be monetized, whether it was appropriately anonymized, and what the impact of that analytics would be. For example, would we change teacher salaries based on this analysis? So as a data community, we need to get in front of this. We don't want more failures, and we want acceptable data services that actually provide value from data. And the reason it's relevant to us is that we're in a unique position here, right? We understand the capabilities of the technology and where they're headed. We, we get the future potential. Uh, but we also, have, as, a, as a community, have a pretty healthy understanding of both the good and harmful aspects of data. So to be effective, though, we need to build trust. And we'll do that a number of ways. The, the first of which is, building trans, is, is using transparency. So what data is collected, how it is shared, and who it is shared with must be transparent to evaluate acceptability. This can't be something that we do as part of each individual service. We as a public have to understand how the data is being used. And we can't enforce policies without transparency. And almost equally important is that we have to learn how to communicate how the data is being used so that people can get comfortable with it and understand how we're getting value from it. We'll build trust through best, best practices. So we need standard procedures and policies that define clear models of how the data is collected and used so that we can get comfortable with those models. And then we can start scaling them to other environments. You know, if we, uh, if we want to succeed here, we have to develop public-private partner, public partnerships because the data is going to span systems necessarily. And going back to the education example, uh, we are making some progress. So uh, California recently passed a couple weeks ago a, a student privacy statute, uh, and that was attempting to update the 40-year-old federal law called the uh, FERPA, or the Federal Education and Rights Privacy Act, and we need to do more of that. And the, the ed tech community kind of piled on and did a nationwide pledge for student privacy, and we need to keep building on these, right? We need to build a service that has both an acceptable governance model and allows us to get value out of student data. To do that, we have to define what abuse is, because that was one of the key points of contention. And there are tough issues beyond the obvious ones that we struggle with today, like how to protect personally identifiable information. The benefits of big data, be that better education, healthcare, access to new financial services like new pricing models and credit, have to be available to all populations, not just the ones that we use to develop the models. So, you know, we as a, a, a relatively data-rich community worry a lot about privacy, but data deserts can be equally harmful. We can harm people just by omitting their data in the systems we build. Finally, we have to establish oversight. So if we want to actually enforce transparency, best practices, and prosecute abusers, we'll need this. It's going to require independent auditing, licensing, and legally enforceable penalties not just pledges. This oversight is going to be especially challenging because, as you've seen in a lot of the talks, we're building big data infrastructure into all of our cloud services. Right? They're becoming, data is becoming transparent to how we function as a society. As people and services span the globe, our data does too. So this has to be a global effort. We have to align practices so that we don't reinvent them for every region of the world or sector of the economy. And if we do this right, data should help us eliminate these borders. We should be able to flow data across it. And we in this room play an important role in that as practitioners. We need to be proactive about being good stewards of the technology we're building. We need to create business models that balance both the right governance models and actually help us get value out of the data.
if we become aware of and active in the data policies, our reality will start to match our ambitions. Thank you.